the Milky Way, our very own cosmic backyard, hosting anywhere between 100 to 400 billion stars. And it is estimated that each star, on average, hosts one habitable planet. That means that in our own little cosmic backyard, there are hundreds of billions of places for life to emerge and flourish. With such immense numbers, how likely is it that life first evolved right here on Earth? How much life is out there? And what if life could spread from one stellar system to another? Seeding life throughout the cosmos. This is the hypothesis of Pan Spermia. Panspermia originates from ancient Greece, literally translating to all seeds. It describes the idea that the seeds of life are spread throughout the universe, germinating and spreading amongst host planets. Perhaps this sounds like a radical idea, but let's take a look at one place where we know life started, right here on Earth. The Earth formed 4.54 billion years ago. The first 500 million years on Earth were harsh. It was the Hadean Eon, a time when the Earth was much hotter than it is today and terrorized by the continuous bombardments of asteroids and comets. Nonetheless, life may have started as early as 4.28 billion years ago, a time on cosmic scales that seems much too fast for random processes to create life out of non-living material. Maybe the bombardments brought more than simple destruction. Perhaps deep within them, they carried the seeds of life. The seeds that then, over billions of years, resulted in us. So let's take a look at the science and see if we might actually be descendants of alien life. In order for life to spread from one planet to another, it must successfully pass through three stages. First, the organism must escape its host planet and start its journey through space. Second, it must survive the transit through space. And third, it must be delivered to the new planet. Stage 1. Escape. To get life from one planet to another, it must first find a way to leave its original planet. Now this, in itself, is no easy feat. There's this cumbersome thing in our universe, called gravity, which tends to pull everything back towards the planet. But nonetheless, there are a few ways in which an escape can happen. Extremely tiny and light organisms may be pushed up high into the atmosphere, floating around at the edge of space. And here, it may be picked up by radiation. The radiation pressure lifting it out of the atmosphere and out into space. A mechanism that was first proposed by Svante Arrhenius in 1903, and it's known as radio panspermia. This mechanism, however, only works for the smallest of organisms, such as single-celled spores. But what if we wanted to launch something bigger, perhaps a eukaryotic cell? or even a multicellular organism? Well, then we need a wildly different mechanism. Every massive object has its own escape velocity. This is the minimum velocity you need to escape that object's gravitational pull, and it's proportional to the square root of its mass. The Earth's escape velocity is around 11.2 kilometers per second, so sending something bigger into space means we must get it to travel at least that fast. Traveling this fast requires an extremely intense event. But fortunately, the universe has its ways. During big asteroid impacts, debris is launched into the air. And if the impacting asteroid was sufficiently big, debris can be launched fast enough to escape the Earth's gravitational pull and start roaming space. Bacterial life on Earth is everywhere, so it is extremely likely that the debris contains microbial life on it or in it. This mechanism is known as lithopanspermia. However, you may wonder, is it even possible to survive such an impact and be launched into space like that? Wouldn't it instantly have killed the potential life that may have escaped? Well, scientists have extensively studied what kinds of forces the organisms must deal with in order to survive. 
And what they found is that they must survive at least 550,000 atmospheric pressure, 300,000 Gs, and a temperature increase of up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. Now, that sounds about as unsurvivable a thing as I can imagine. However, scientists got to work. They got excited and they started shooting organisms with tremendous speeds against walls, crushing them between metal plates at incredible pressures and ultra centrifuging them to simulate these stresses. And what they found is that some organisms can actually survive these conditions. Stage two, transit. Now that our organisms are underway, the long part starts. Traveling from one planet to another takes a tremendous amount of time. Millions to billions of years. Time which the organisms must survive. Space is a hazardous place for life. It is extremely cold, dry and permeated with deadly radiation. Many organisms are known to be able to survive the cold vacuum of space. Tardigrades, eight-legged micro-animals, for example, have been sent out into space and survived. The real problem, especially for long journeys, is UV radiation, which kills unshielded organisms very swiftly. Shielded organisms may survive longer, up to millions of years. And organisms also have another trick up their sleeves. They can enter cryptobiosis, which is a special state to help them survive extremely hostile conditions such as those endured in space. From this, at first glance, it seems like radiopanspermia is not a viable option because all the organisms would immediately get killed by the UV radiation. But perhaps there's one way in which radiopanspermia can increase its odds. Our very own solar system is surrounded by a gigantic belt of icy comets, some hundred billion in the Oort cloud. Some of the organisms driven out by radiation may impact these icy comets, giving them a new sheltered home where they are safely protected. This would drastically increase their lifespans and may be a viable way of transporting life over vast distances and timescales. Now let's take a look at our second option, lipopenspermia, where our organisms travel inside a protective casing, such as a big rock. Now you may think that life cannot survive inside a rock, but as usual, life finds a way. We have found a spore forming species of bacillus inside a 250 million year old salt crystal, indicating some microbes can survive for hundreds of millions of years, which is the right time scale for interplanetary travel. And then there's also the endoliths, these are organisms that acquire their resources from the inner parts of rocks, which is perfect. This shields them from deadly radiation and could provide a stable environment for the long journey ahead. And then there's also a sort of deluxe version being proposed, where life may be harbored inside the cores of comets. The cores of comets may be heated by radioactive decay, allowing it to host liquid water. We have even looked for evidence of life in comets. With the Rosetta mission, we studied the trail of comet 67P and found an abundance of organic chemicals. It even found amino acids and key components for DNA and cell membranes. Some have even argued that these chemicals are the byproduct of life. Over 99% of all organic chemicals on Earth are produced by life. And therefore, they argue, it is very likely that the organic molecules from the trail of the comet are produced by living organisms inside of it. Living organisms that are spread throughout the universe. After having made the long transit, we now enter the third and final stage, delivery. For now, let's stick with the idea that our organisms are inside a rock or comet. The rock would have to enter an Earth-like planet, meaning that it has an atmosphere. The question then becomes, can microbes inside rocks survive hypervelocity entry through an Earth-like atmosphere? Again, eager scientists got to work on this question. They inoculated the bacterium B. subtilis spores onto granite domes and launched these to 120 km altitude strapped on a rocket. The spores on the side of the rocks actually survived 
but died on the forward-facing surface due to heating. For microbes inside rocks, the chance that part of them survives is also pretty good, given they are of the right type. The real hard part about delivery, however, is reaching the target destination. Space is extremely fast, and only minuscule portions of it are occupied by stuff. Even a tinier part of that stuff is occupied by habitable planets. So hitting the target is a hard task indeed. One proposed mechanism to increase the odds is that the rock or comet carrying life may find a protoplanetary disk, still full of dust, which could act as sort of a net that captures it. The asteroid or comet could even collide with other small parts and spread some life among them. To then, when planets have formed, seed life on the planet. So, to summarize, we have the available mechanisms allowing panspermia, and we have microbial life that may survive the long trip, as well as re-entry. But let's take a look at some alternative versions. The Nobel Prize winner Francis Crick, together with Leslie Orgel, proposed the idea of directed panspermia, life that was intentionally brought to Earth by an advanced civilization, perhaps to see how it would evolve over time. Now, even if this idea turns out not to be right, it is still a very important one to consider, since we have now gotten to the stage where we ourselves can be the orchestrator of directed panspermia. Now, this could be intentional, for example, by sending probes containing microbial life out into the cosmos. Or it could be unintentional, a side effect of us sending spacecraft into space, but then being contaminated with life that survived the trip. There are some serious implications for this that we must consider. For this reason, we also crashed the Galileo probe into Jupiter and not one of its moons so that the moons would not be contaminated with earthly life. And when we do look for life on those moons, we know it cannot come from Earth. But it gets even more exciting. Some claim that we have already found evidence for alien life. They claim to have found these microfossils in meteorites older than 4.5 billion years, predating the Earth. Now they do look awfully similar to simple bacteria found right here on Earth suggesting that perhaps the earliest forms of life were seeded from the cosmos. Others propose that organic material, viruses, and dead organisms rain down on Earth frequently, causing things such as plagues or spurring on evolution. Still others have observed the spectra of interstellar dust and compared it with the spectrum of frozen E. coli. The authors claim that they are the same, which suggests that frozen bacteria are pervasively spread throughout space and could seed life on the barren planets they encounter. However, the evidence for all these alternative proposals are not conclusive. Nonetheless, it's a beautiful idea. The idea that life is not simply contained to a single planet, but is exchanged between different stellar systems. Most importantly, the idea that life is pervasive throughout the galaxy, a galaxy that may be filled with millions to hundreds of millions of planets with plant life and animal life. Spacefaring life at the moment seems more unlikely since we would expect to see signs of them. But imagine venturing out into the unknown and finding planets hosting rich ecosystems, perhaps even slowly exchanging bits of life with our own making us a bit less lonely than we may have thought we were.